Good afternoon. I want to thank the uh, Illinois Arborist Association for giving me this opportunity to present to you today. My name is Carl Krogstad, and I am both a registered landscape architect and a certified arborist. And uh, what I'm talking to you about today is uh, combining these two practices together and creating a unified landscape design that takes into account any existing trees and all the processes that go along with that. So this uh, presentation is probably a little bit different than a lot of the other ones that you are um, experiencing during this uh, conference because mine is less technical and more uh, applies to how um, the work that you're doing will be in a practical sense, uh, working with homeowners and commercial uh, people alike, um, that your clients will um, be able to see the results of saving trees and adding to the property values of their properties and also for their own enjoyment. So before I um, begin my presentation, I just want to give you a little bit of uh, my background and explain to you how I um, really have gotten that this is a passion of mine to um, work design and make sure that the existing vegetation and trees are properly maintained and that they can uh, survive the entire process. So I actually started out when I went to college as an art major, but I discovered pretty quickly that I was a little bit um, too practical for the art world. And so I started looking at other related fields. And when I um, discovered landscape architecture, I realized that it's something I've always enjoyed. Plants, I was a gardener and I like to take care of uh, landscaping. And so it was a, a real natural fit for me. I began, um, I, well, I did receive my uh, bachelor's degree in landscape architecture from the University of Illinois uh, way back in uh, 1983. So I've been doing this for uh, quite a while. My first job, a couple of jobs, I switched back and forth between doing commercial work and um, switching to residential work. So I kind of got involved with both areas. But in 1988, I started working for a home builder, a local one who was doing a lot of work in Long Grove and they were buying uh, wooded sites. One in particular, which uh, developed into Royal Melbourne, uh, that, site had a lot of trees and it, because I was a landscape architect, they put me in charge of doing uh, tree preservation work, um, also uh, putting together guidelines for the homeowners association on tree preservation. At the time, I have to admit, I really didn't know that much about it. And so I was um, kind of uh, doing a lot of research and this was the time before the internet. So doing research involved going to the library, talking to people that I knew and, and really trying to put together um, this tree preservation ordinance, which later when I left the company, I started with a landscape consulting firm and I became the reviewer of those um, tree preservation plans that the individual homeowners did uh, within the association. Um, to be honest, I was kind of learning as I went along and I made some mistakes, especially when it came to transplanting trees that we had in the ordinance. Um, I later discovered how difficult that was, and I'll talk about that a little bit later in this presentation. Um, but uh, I continued to do that, and when I was with that consulting company, I also had lots of uh, commercial clients, particularly when designing a new site, a wooded subdivision or something, who also made the assumption that, well, you're a landscape architect, you should be able to do tree inventories, tree preservation plans, and guide us on um, the tree preservation work. I, um, again, continue to learn more and more. Um, some of the reviewers um, helped me, especially, I had a lot of reviews by uh, Chuck Stewart and Urban Forest Management at the time. And they um, helped me to learn more about, you know, what it takes to preserve trees. Also, I worked a lot with uh, Charlie Keppel um, and uh, the trimming and the tree preservation work that they were doing and uh, got a lot of help from both of them. And then after doing that for about 25 years, when the recession hit back in 08, um, I am my friend, uh, Dr. Frederick Miller, started encouraging me to take the exam and actually being a, 
becoming a certified arborist, and he thought that would uh, um, help um, with my work, and it actually did. I did take the exam in uh, 2012 and passed it, and um, now I've been doing work with my company. It, it actually works very well because I can get involved in the process either as a certified arborist and then carry through with the landscape architecture, or sometimes I get um, a job because I'm a landscape architect and they have existing trees and I can tell them, well, you, this is what you really need to do in order to reserve these trees and work them into your site. Um, I continue to do both uh, design and consulting for uh, homeowners directly for single family residences, but also for, I have been involved in a lot of assisted living, senior care projects and um, office and uh, also subdivisions. But in each case, the homeowners and the people who are own, buying the property or developing the property usually want to save the trees. One of the reasons that they pick wooded sites is because they want to preserve the trees and preserve the field. Um, so what I want to talk about is how the whole process works and how you as a certified arborist or an arborist can get involved in the entire uh, process. So the first step in the process is one that you're probably all familiar with, which is the um, doing the existing tree inventory and field analysis of trees that are on the site. Now, a lot of the communities currently um, have tree preservation ordinances, and these can vary tremendously from um, city to city or um, municipality to municipality. Um, one of the things is it's often difficult to even find these ordinances. They don't make it easy to find online, but uh, they can vary between um, that you have to locate every tree that's two inches and above, or some are 12 inches above, some are even different sizes depending on what subspecies category they are. For instance, you can have 12 inches and up for box elder, but you know, three inches and up for um, hackberry. And so knowing the ordinance for that town is very important. Some of them do not have ordinances. Um, that's becoming less and less common, but the ones that don't, I still recommend if you can, you know, doing a residence to go through the process with them so that they can preserve the trees that they're having, even if it's not required by code. Um, one of the things that where you specifically should contact or locate trees and analyze them are in um, the construction zone. And when I talk about in the construction zone, I'm referring to the critical root zone being in the construction zone. So if you have a large tree, like maybe a 26 inch tree, is if that tree is 26 inches, 26 feet from where you are doing the construction, um, that should be considered in your analysis um, and your inventory. Also, any way that you are approaching the site during the construction, uh, such as uh, if you're going around a house to build a pool or some other um, patio or deck, um, how is that access going to be affected um, and what kind of equipment will they be bringing in or um, even the equipment that they're bringing in uh, may have to be altered based on trying to save a tree. Um, so the one of the things that I like about, you know, the current technology that's out there, it used to be that you put tags on all the trees and that made it difficult for offsite trees. So if you were putting um, a patio in the backyard of your house and you wanted to inventory the tree next door, usually you couldn't put a, a tag on the tree, you just had to give it a number. And now because of GPS um, and the location of trees uh, in that way, you can locate offsite trees just as easily and have them be part of your inventory. Um, what, I'm, what you're seeing now is an example of a um, tree preservation and uh, removal and uh, replacement plan that was required by the specific uh, municipality. So on the upper right uh, left corner, I'm showing a blow up of one of the tree 
action plan is what I call it. So it's a tree inventory with a column that says what is going to be happening to that specific tree. Now maybe root pruning, there may be some trimming that has to happen, especially if the structure that's going in um, or the landscaping would interfere in some way with the lower branches. So you make recommendations as far as those trees. And again, this is something arborists frequently do. Um, and then also locating um, the uh, replacement trees that are required for the municipality. And as a landscape architect, I've always been um, really trying to locate the trees in a place where it would not interfere with future plans of the um, homeowner. Um, so that, for instance, they're not putting a replacement tree right where they would probably want a patio or a deck and considering where that right off the bat, especially if they're not hiring me as a landscape architect, to, to have a pretty good idea where those are going to go and not be a conflict later on. Um, one of the things, too, is to have um, both tree preservation specifications and notes, but also tree removal notes. And uh, I had a funny story a few years back. I was with a company and I um, had just started there and they did not have any tree removal specifications. So I asked one of the young women to write those up for a project and she um, had a little bit of attitude saying, well, why should I do that? Everyone knows how to cut down trees. And so I said, well, is it okay to put a, a chain around the tree and pull it out when it's among other trees? And she said, Obviously not, they, you know, no one would do that. And I said, really? Um, unfortunately, there are people who will do that. So having um, the specifications on the drawing um, is something that is very important so that you don't um, do damage to other trees when you're removing the trees that need to be taken out. Um, and I'll just say a quick note that's, you know, sometimes removing the trees or for good forestry practice as well, um, taking out buckthorn, uh, taking out, um, uh, box elder or disease trees um, that if you see that they have, um, you know, emerald ash borer, for instance, or, you know, various uh, diseases that you may be taking out, even if they can physically be preserved, once you're the arborist on the site, you should make recommendations for any disease trees. And again, these are recommendations. They don't always follow because some people want to save a tree no matter what, but, you know, you can put together a report and work with the landscape architect and other consultants on, on getting all that together. So when a design is put together, typically um, the landscape architect will first work out the hardscapes and then work the plantings around it. I mean, they may be thinking about it all at once, but it's kind of like a puzzle and the first pieces you put in are the hardscapes, which would include uh, swimming pools, um, putting in patios, wood decks, um, even pathways or other um, amenities such as that, and, and bigger lots. It could include uh, tennis courts, and it could include um, you know, for assisted living or other you know, th projects like that, it could be parking. So all that goes into effect first. And what, I'm, what you're seeing here is a site that I recently worked on. Unfortunately, um, I can't show you the final, the in, final product because it hasn't been installed yet. They're just starting the work um, as we speak. But uh, on this site, there were a couple of um, nice oaks and then there were other trees such as silver maple, but we wanted to locate the pool in order that they wanted to put in um, in such a way that we could minimize the impact on the oaks. And so the one you see here on the um, left is one of the oaks that we we're particularly interested in, um, in preserving and not doing any damage to. So on the drawing on the right, this is the tree that's kind of on the left side, the, the large one, um, if you can read it, it's like two, tree number 2887. And um, so we ended up putting the pool a little bit closer to the house than they originally wanted. They actually wanted it set back a little bit further, um, but it was getting too far into the critical root zone. And what you don't see on this drawing, um, at the very south end, just below where um, it says uh, um, electric line um, at an angle there, that was another oak. So we're trying to 
keep it away from these two oaks. And uh, the other issue we had in this part of the puzzle was that the electric line, that the, the ComEd line, had to be relocated because it was currently going right through the, the area where the pool is going. And of course, there's uh, regulations as far as how far that uh, line has to be from the pool itself. So we worked and balanced all these things. Now, on this project, um, I had a team that we were working together and we went out to the site several times. So it was the pool contractor, the landscape contractor that had been selected, myself and even a lighting designer um, because we wanted to put some lighting for the trees. And again, even utilities like that um, are going to damage, could potentially damage the tree if you're putting in lighting, even low voltage lighting. All this should be considered and working together with all the various groups. On this side too, we had to look at the um, the way into the site, and I'll go over that in a little bit more um, detail as well. But irrigation can also be a pretty substantial issue because you don't want irrigation lines to go in and damage the roots. And also you want to make sure that the irrigation, the amount of water that's going on these trees doesn't become a detriment um, by overwatering the trees. So all these things are, are different factors that need to be uh, considered. Um, here are a couple sites, just another quick case studies. Um, the one on the left, it was a very, um, a very steep slope going down to a lake. And you can see the house. Um, you can kind of see the flag over here. There's an existing deck and that's just the edge of the house. And they wanted a series of uh, steps going down to the lake and different areas they could sit on the way down. Now, when I first met with them, they really wanted, their idea was to do a bunch of terraces and put in um, different patios, paved patio areas. Um, but I told them right away, well, if you want to save these trees, many of which were oaks or some hickories and others, that we really have to consider doing extending your deck um, and maybe making that a multi-level deck coming down. And then as we got further down toward the lake where it was a little bit more open, then we transitioned into uh, hardscape paving material. So in this case, you can see um, in the multi-level deck, we left openings for the trees to come through and then um, had steps coming down. And then you can see you know, toward the um, bottom of this drawing how we're starting to get into a terrace that's more of a, uh, a pa paved area. But even then, I used um, decomposed gravel or, rot or rot rotten granite, it's sometimes referred to, that it could have some uh, infiltration of water to get into the root systems. But when you're designing a, a deck like this, um, it's important to remember now you, you've got trees, and in this case you have oaks, and you may have walnuts in a similar situation that we're not just concerned about how um, the trees are affected by people, but how the trees affect people. So um, in this case, you know, if you have oak trees and walnut trees and you know, their fruit is dropping, the acorns and the walnuts are dropping on people, that's not a good combination. Or if there's you know, fruit trees and you have birds, that's even worse um, when they're, you know, they're dropping. So um, in this case, we have the octagon area that was designed as part of the deck. And although we didn't show up because of building permits, they wanted to have the option to leave it open. The long-term plan is to enclose that with a roof and make it a gazebo and then possibly even have screening for mosquitoes and stuff. So um, you want to take into consideration that, yes, if you're designing for uh, a deck that's in among the trees, um, you do have to consider the, you know, having some kind of roof above that often so that, you know, people aren't sitting there being bombarded the whole time with, with acorns and, and similar fruit. Um, the second one uh, aside here is a, a case where the person, the owner, bought a, um, a lot next to them that was um, partly open, partly um, a pretty good grove of walnuts. And in this case, you can see the drawing below, they had the existing house and they wanted to create a fire pit area and a patio that they could go out to. And so we located the trees, we located where that could be to have a minimum impact on the trees. Um, but then uh, we also have the issue that, you know, walnuts 
or there's the susceptibility to a thousand cankers, which also will, in the long term, um, I told them, well, let's just assume that within a few years, these walnuts will be dying and, and you want to replace them. So what we did in this case is we considered the species. Um, first of all, we had to then consider, um, because with the walnuts, you have the juggling, um, juggalone toxicity, we had to really consider the type of plants that could be grown in that area, but also wanted to look at some screening with, with some evergreens because this was near a road um, on the other side, but also putting in some small sapling oaks, just mixing them in there because I told them as these trees um, start to die, you want something that's gonna take over later. And so these are considerations too in the design um, considering what kind of, you know, like the juglone, um, you have to consider deer um, and what kind of impact they will have. Um, and then, you know, what kind of uh, plantings would disturb the roots of the trees that you have. So there's, again, sometimes I've even had clients say, well, this is like a giant puzzle that we have to put together. And I said, yeah, it is. Um, there's a lot of things to consider, but it, we can work it out and it can all work together. Um, additionally, with planting design, um, what I, and this is kind of a, a segue from the plant, the hardscapes into the planting design, but here's a, an estate that I worked on both these photographs in uh, Barrington Hills, and they have, you know, pretty much everything. They have the swimming, in-ground swimming pool, or the swim house, and the tennis court, and they just built a new conservatory attached to their house and a big patio. And so you can see on this lower right one photograph, this is kind of where the new patio is. Um, and then they wanted pathways that connected to the pool house and the tennis court. But a lot of the plantings, the more detailed plantings, I did away from the existing trees. So again, we're not disturbing roots. Um, we're not uh, you know, causing difficulty for those trees by changing the watering that they'll get received too. Like when when you do put in perennials, you're gonna increase the amount of watering. So try to limit that. And the, the photograph on the upper left shows part of that, you know, so the one walkway is going to the tennis court, the other one's going to the swimming pool. We put a little fountain feature in the middle, but look, the larger trees, um, we did not disturb anything around them. And we just left them an open lawn and, you know, a lot of them we recommended and we're putting in larger circles of uh, mulch around them to kind of protect them. So trying to keep the pathways away from the trees, keep the plantings even away from the trees as much as possible and let the trees kind of stand on their own so that we're not uh, disturbing the root system. This upper left is a, again, the pool building from the same project and you can see the walkway coming around, but they had some smaller existing trees and around those we did you know, kind of to make the side of the building a little nicer. Um, still left a ring around each immediate tree, but also with the smaller trees, we could put um, some more plantings around it. But putting in this case, some ferns near the tree itself, where we don't have to dig down as far. And then when we get a little bit further away, um, we you know, put in some shrubs, like in this case, I think boxwoods. The, bottom, the one below that is very similar. They had some existing trees, not too big, um, but uh, we could put in some perennials around them. And these are, you know, a birch, a pear in the back here, and I forget what this one is, but uh, they were all hardier trees. But even those, I put the boxwood kind of between them so that we're, we're putting boxwood right around them and creating um, issues by digging into root systems. Um, the two on the right, this shows a before and after of the same area. Um, so they had this area in the back where they had been informally burning wood and uh, having a fire pit, but they wanted to make it a much more attractive and destination. And so the bottom photograph shows what we came up with. But they had some pines, uh, some white pines here, a couple of spruce, um, some other things um, in the area. And what located the fire pit and the paved area between them. So we, again, minimized any impact on the trees, put in mainly, you know, smaller plants, grasses, and uh, uh, or um, 
perennials. And then this is one thing I like to do when you get near root trees as tree roots as well, is to put in, you know, some boulders that are set on top um, so that you're not, again, digging in. And then you could either put flower pots on them. You can, you know, put things like, uh, here's a bird bath. Um, you could also do that without the boulder. You could just put a large flower pot mixed in the mulch bed or even, you know, have a, like a shepherd's hook that you can hang a hanging basket from. So you get that planting in color, um, but you're really minimizing the amount of disturbance on the trees that you're trying to preserve. A few other quick examples. Um, the one in the upper left uh, is really good if you can. This is kind of a little bit more open with smaller plantings. This, I think, may have been a hawthorn, um, you know, maple. And, and so just we just said, well, let's just seed it with uh, native uh, plantings and have it a no-mow area and just let the uh, trees grow there. And again, it's minimal disturbance. We didn't really grade in that area. We didn't have to because it wasn't gonna be a lawn and this was a retired couple, so they were fine um, having part of their yard and they liked that they moved out to, this is out in Marengo. They moved out from the inner suburbs to be kind of out in you know more of a rural area. So they were really open to that. The one below it, one of the things um, to always consider and why one reason why the species is also important is uh, because every tree um, has different tolerance of work around it. So this, I believe, was an ash. Um, I know this site was covered with ash trees, which I, mean, I did this back in uh, 2005, the design for this one. Unfortunately, I think most of the ash trees are gone because of the emerald ash borer. But at the time, this did not have a detrimental effect on them. So we put grasses and other smaller plants, trimmed them up, um, and uh, it gave a real nice effect for this assisted living facility. This is a memory care facility that they wanted to keep the trees. And now, even though the older trees are gone, it's been uh, 15 years, so these smaller trees, these evergreens that we planted and some of the other things have now grown up. And so they do have a... a nice environment and the uh, saving those existing ash trees did serve its purpose. And, uh, and now it's, uh, we've got the large trees again. Um, and then the two on the right just show a little bit of a different treatment again, based on the type of tree. Um, you can see the upper uh, photograph, um, and this was a, a large residence and they had maintenance people that would put in the annuals every year. So I usually don't use many annuals like this, but we did on this one. Um, but I think this was a um, hickory and those have a little bit deeper root systems. So we were able to put, you know, some of the ground cover. And again, we didn't put anything big to dig really deep down, but we could put uh, annuals and perennials around the base of this tree. Whereas the second photograph, oh, and also the pathway, you know, somewhat around it. It's, a, it's permeable, but we, again, wanted to minimize, you know, disturbance around certain trees. And you can see in the back, there are some oaks. And the second photograph shows that a little bit more. When we had the oaks, we kept the planting and the pathway away from them and kind of put a mulch ring. And you can still really enjoy the garden, but by looking at each individual tree and the type of species that it is, um, and knowing the species, then um, that really helps with the design of how you're going to treat those uh, individual trees. Um, I want to transition a little bit into now construction considerations. Um, there's a couple of things, and this is where an arborist can get involved right from the very beginning. Um, you want to, in minimizing any damage to the trees, a lot of the work will have to be done by hand. Um, this first photograph shows you know, in the work on this site, there are a lot of existing trees in the front. So um, we built walkways and this little drainage ditch and stuff, but we wanted to minimize any impact as much as possible um, on the trees. And so, you know, working by hand with hand tools, it's more labor intensive and it will add to the cost, but that's what needs to be done in order to ensure that down the road in five years, um, trees aren't dying. So that's the, the first thing. The second thing um, is this is the access. This is the project I talked about earlier where there was an access 
going to the back and the tree here is the silver maple. Um, so we took a look at that as a team and we decided that, you know, they could bring in small skid steers and other um, equipment, um, maybe dingoes. Um, they'll take the fence down in the back temporarily. They'll probably have to repair this walkway, and, but we can keep far enough away from the silver maple that we think that it's not going to be detrimental. We may trim some of the bottom branches um, to make sure that they don't get damaged. Now, had this been an oak, we probably would have to tell the homeowner that either you need to take it down or just keep in mind that maybe in three years it won't survive. And uh, those are all things that it would be, it's very beneficial. I mean, you would want to tell a homeowner at the beginning so that they know what they're dealing with and not surprised later by, oh yeah, the work we did killed the tree. If you can tell them, here's your choices, um, then they can make a decision and then they're aware that, okay, yeah, maybe I won't take down the tree right now, but I have in my mind that it's probably not gonna survive the damage that was done. Um, but in this case, we had a silver maple and um, it was in pretty good shape. So I think it'll hold up um, from the construction. So with that, um, I just wanna uh, kind of explain, now a lot of you are arborists and you say, well, that's all well and good, but I get called before the job, I do the inventory and then I never hear from them again. Or they, you might say, well, I get the call three years later when the trees are all dying and it's too late for me to do anything. You know, what can I, you know, all I can tell them, I end up being the bearer of bad news and say, well, had they done these, this correctly on the front end, um, you could have saved these trees, but now there's not a whole lot we can do for them. So um, what I am suggesting, uh, it, and again, with my position of being both a arborist and a landscape architect, um, it just flows right in from, from one to the other. But uh, what I would very strongly recommend, um, if you're not doing this already, is develop um, relationships with other disciplines so that it becomes just a natural part of the process for them to bring you in the team. So I think the strongest ones would be either um, landscape architects like myself, but I think another one that's very important are civil engineers. I've had um, a lot of dealings with civil engineers. Um, I actually get a lot of my work from civil engineers, but one of the, the things that I am almost sure of, and may, hopefully this has changed, but I almost think that they teach them in school that as long as you're not cutting near a tree, you can put fill on the roots of a tree. And I've had so many people when I review their engineering and say, you either have to put a retaining wall here or you have to change the grading because you're gonna kill this tree that you're saying you're preserving. They'll respond, well, I'm not cutting, I'm putting fill. Can it take like a foot of fill? And I'm like, no, these are living, breathing things. They breathe through their roots, you can't do that. So. Working with civil engineers, um, it, the idea is to try to get it to where when there's a wooded site, they would automatically say, well, we need to bring in an arborist. And if you have developed that relationship, you would be the arborist that they would bring in. Um, the other thing is once you do that, if you're working in the other ones are landscape contractors, um, that uh, you can be working with them from the very beginning and training them, you know, don't or any kind of contractors, the landscape contractors, pool contractors, um, even uh, deck builders to say, okay, this is what you have to consider to save these trees and the homeowner wants to save these and they add value to the house. I remember a few years ago, this actually goes way back, but I was, uh, we did work to save a fairly large oak in the front yard of a house. And we even put the fence up and everything. Um, and then, I came out to the site and the concrete contractor had cleaned out the um, cement mixer chute on the roots and on the base of the trees. So and now you had this tree with a big hunk of, of concrete on it. And I was just uh, appalled and the homeowner was too. And, um, but part of the idea is if you have the specifications of what needs to be done either on the drawings or have some kind of training that the general contractor at least will know, or the you know, contractors involved will know what procedures need to be um, 
worked out and be incorporated in the design, they can also price for that because that's often an issue. I think as long as they're getting paid extra for the extra work, they will include it. And as long as the homeowner knows that, that this is what you have to do or the uh, commercial contractor or developer needs, knows that up front, they, um, everything will go much more smoothly. So again, my bottom, the bottom line here for you as Arborists is develop these relationships, get, um, get uh, uh, part of a team that again, whenever there's a wooded site, they just automatically say, okay, this is wooded, we'll, and they can tell the client, we need to bring this person in if you wanna save the trees because they offer um, a huge value and uh, really help the overall development. 